And then I heard that uh, in France, one night he'd gone on stage without his band, but dressed in white robes and told everybody that indeed he was the coming messiah. And he just got booed off. I mean, they just went mad and it was like the end of his career. So Vince Taylor really became very much one of the building blocks of the Ziggy character. You know, because, uh, I just thought he was just too good to be true. He was of another world. He was from somewhere else. And he was definitely part of the blueprint of this strange character that came from somewhere. By the time Bowie started writing Ziggy Stardust in late 1971, Vince Taylor seemed like a distant memory from the past. However, the 1970s saw a few bands paying tribute to him. In 1973, Dutch band Golden Earring released a song called Just Like Vince Taylor, which paid homage to the then forgotten British rocker. And The Clash paid the ultimate tribute to him when they covered his song Brand New Cadillac and included it on their album London Calling, thus introducing Taylor's music to a whole new generation. this nightmare of a guy. He was uh, an American expatriate who had some small degree of success on English television, on, on probably shows like Six Five Special or Oh Boy, Jack Good type shows. I, I remember him being in a round in that, there were Dickie Pride and Adam Faith and Vince Eager, there's the other Vince, yeah. Yeah, there was kind of this, you know, motley crew of English would-be Elvises. There were there was hundreds of them. All of them were Elvis. You got your Elvis A, B, C, or D. You know, do you want one with a light suit or a dark suit? They're all on the same show. And Cliff was the leader of the Elvises, and he was one of them, probably the most authentic of the lot. In as much as he was at least American, so the accent was correct, but his his music was pretty pony. If you're looking for trouble. Right in my face. Vince Taylor wasn't an American expatriate as Bowie claimed. Taylor, whose real name was Brian Holden, was actually born in Isleworth, Middlesex in 1939. However, the family moved to New Jersey in 1946 when he was seven years old. A few years later, Taylor's sister Sheila married Joe Barbera of the famous Hanna-Barbera cartoon partnership, and the whole family moved to California. Their arrival in California coincided with the rise of rock and roll. Elvis Presley and many other rockers took the nation by storm, and Taylor started dreaming about becoming a star himself. In 1957, he moved back to Britain and started hanging out at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar in Soho. This was the place where all the aspiring rock musicians in London used to gather. Taylor caused quite a sensation at the coffee bar, he wore jet black hair, had cool American clothes that you couldn't get in England, and he spoke with an American accent. In fact, he told everyone that he was American, and never mentioned that he was actually born in Isleworth. Taylor soon met other musicians and formed Vince Taylor and the Playboys. The band featured future Shadows members Brian Bennett and Brian Licorice Locking. And the guitarist was Tony Sheridan, who later went solo and worked with the Beatles during their Hamburg days. The band released their first single in 1958. Vince Taylor and the Playboys started touring and became one of the best live bands in Britain. Tony Sheridan left the band after their first single to start a solo career, and he was replaced by Joe Moretti. Later in the 60s, Moretti became one of the most in-demand session guitarists in Britain along with Jimmy Page and Big Jim Sullivan. Joe Moretti remembered. Could you describe how he looks and how he acted on stage? Sure, he looked very, very sexy and very sinuous. Lots of gyrating sort of Elvis-style things. Quite athletic, and the chicks loved it. Teddy boys, I don't like them at all. I don't like their style of dress. It's just to prove what they are, and they're very ignorant. I think if their parents watched over them a bit better when they were smaller, they might grow up to be good citizens. I blame their parents. I'll give you an instance of teddy boys. I was going to the chemist the other day for medicine for my children. It was a rather a deserted street, and there was about six of them coming along, and they thought they'd have a go at me. But I singled out the ringleader, and I give him a real good punching on the nose. 
and I don't think he'll ever attempt to interfere with anybody else in future. Despite their success as a live band and appearances on television shows such as Oh Boy, the band wasn't selling too many records. However, their following single brand new Cadillac seemed destined to become a huge hit. Well, my baby drove up in a brand new Cadillac. The single was released in November 1959, but unfortunately, chart success eluded him again. Joe Moretti recalled, It was bad because it had the words Cadillac and Ford in it, and we weren't allowed to advertise on the BBC. They called that advertising, you see. Due to the lack of success, the Playboys started working on other projects. Licorice Locking joined the Shadows, and Joe Moretti turned to session work. The guitarist played in another British classic from that era, Shaking All Over by Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. Vince Taylor found himself without a band, and he was once again hanging around Soho looking for musicians. A few months later, he met drummer Bobby Clark, who had played with Marty Wilde and Billy Fury, and asked him to join his band. Vince and Bobby found other musicians, and the new Vince Taylor and the Playboys were formed. As a curious note, a 16-year-old Jimmy Page briefly joined the Playboys when guitarist Kenny Pavel temporarily left the band. The group finally managed to score a hit. Jet Black Machine, which was released in August 1960, stayed in the charts nine weeks and reached the top 15. Go over, baby. I got a machine that's hot, and it's just raring to go. Despite their newfound success, Taylor's unreliability caused arguments within the band. Vince was constantly missing gigs or failing to show up for rehearsals and recording sessions. So the group finally decided to sack him, and they changed their name to the Bobby Clark Noise. In 1961, the newly christened Bobby Clark Noise was scheduled to play at the Olympia in Paris. The bill, which was supposed to be topped by Wee Willie Harris, also included Duffy Power and Vince Eager. Despite being sacked from the band, Vince Taylor still remained friends with the group. Taylor had never been to France and he asked them if he could travel to Paris with them. The singer told them that he would even perform for free if necessary. The band agreed to take him with them. During sound check at the Olympia, Vince Taylor dressed up in his black leather gear and added a chain around his neck with a Joan of Arc medallion which he'd bought on arrival in France. The organizers were incredibly impressed by their sound check. In fact, they were so impressed that they decided to put them on top of the bill for both shows. Their two shows at the Olympia were a huge success. So Eddie Barkley, head of the Barkley label, decided to sign Vince and the band to a six-year record deal with the label. Drummer Bobby Clark remembered. So Eddie Barclay came in and his right-hand man, Jean Fernandez, come in and he said, uh, Vince, that was a very, very good show. We've never seen anything like that. And then he just said, um, oh, Vince, have you got a recording contract? So Vince says, no. So he said, well, if you're not tied, would you like to come and uh, sign up with me and I'm going to try and make you one of the biggest stars in Europe? Safid said, well, yes, yes, I, th I think that would be a good idea. So, OK, shook hands like you do. And they went out the door and as soon as they went out the door, Vince went, yeah, jumps up in the air screaming, yes, 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 yes we're going to make it again. This was the beginning of a period of enormous success for Vince Taylor and the band. The Barclay label released several records by the group, and Vince Taylor constantly appeared on the cover of French magazines. Taylor became known in France as Le Diable Noir, the Black Devil, and he hung out with La Creme de la Creme of the Paris scene. The band also enjoyed major success in other European countries such as Belgium and the Netherlands, and they were selling out major venues night after night. Their audiences were so excited by their wild sound and performance that several gigs ended up in riot. We did a 21-day Belgium tour, and before we even started the tour, we had three shows 
console. Finished. And the reason for that is we don't want Vince Sadder in this theatre. He's going to wreck the place. You know, we can't afford him smashing up the seats and everything like that. Of course, the enthusiasm that happened there, maybe, with the cheers and the jumping up and down, uh, is rock and roll. But the destruction is caused by only a small, small percentage of the crowd. I am a person, a normal person, on the stage. My stage act is an act. And as far as in the street or, uh, or a way of life, I'm, I, like everyone else, I'm a normal person. And that's about it, I think. Uh, well, rock and roll is an exciting side of all music. It's the kids' music. It's for young people. If they want to enjoy themselves, I think they should enjoy themselves. By the end of 1962, however, the Playboys had fallen out with Vince Taylor once again due to his unreliability. And Bobby Clark became Johnny Halliday's drummer for a couple of years, until he reunited with Vince Taylor again in 1964. At that point, the band's lineup had changed considerably. The group now featured a young percussionist called Prince Stash de Rolla. Rolling Stones fans who are watching this video may remember Prince Stash de Rolla as the guy who appeared on multiple pictures with Brian Jones around 1966 and 1967. Stash ended up becoming one of Brian's best friends. Prince Stash de Rolla was a bohemian aristocrat who was the son of Polish-French modern artist Balthus. And his mother was from an old and influential aristocratic family from Switzerland. Their bloodline even included poet Lord Byron. Stash de Rolla also ended up becoming part of the Beatles' circle of friends, and he even played on their song You Know My Name Look Up The Number, a track which also featured Brian Jones on saxophone. Stash's friendship with Brian Jones actually started in April 1965, when Vince Taylor opened for the Rolling Stones at the Olympia in Paris. In an interview for Ugly Things magazine, Stash de Rolla remembered, In 1965, we opened for the Stones at the Paris Olympia over the entire Eastern weekend. So we played five shows together and became excellent friends with them in the bargain. In May 1965, just a month after their gig with the Stones, Vince Taylor traveled to London in order to collect funds to pay his band, to whom he owed a considerable amount of money. Vince Taylor was supposed to go to London, collect the funds, and return, all within the same day. However, while in London, Taylor was invited to a party celebrating Bob Dylan's tour of the UK. This was the tour that was documented on the film Don't Look Back. The party took place at London's Savoy Hotel, and Vince Taylor met Bob Dylan and future Velvet Underground muse Nico who was living in London at the time after signing a deal with Immediate Records, the label founded by Stones manager Andrew Oldham. Taylor got his first taste of LSD at that party, and that's when things took a turn for the worse. The London trip, no pun intended, proved to be fatal. Prince Stash de Rolla recalled, Vince ran into Nico and Bob Dylan and others, and was somehow induced to take acid, methadrine, and who knows what else. Much to our considerable distress, he remained in London for several days going without sleep and ingesting massive amounts of drugs and a great deal of Matthias wine. We were supposed to play a showcase concert at the Locomotive in Paris in order to secure a huge amount of financial backing from Vince's brother-in-law Joe Barbera of Hanna-Barbera fame. Barbera wanted us to conquer America and be the spearhead of a new venture in the record business. The band was in top shape. The concert was instantly sold out. And it was a mere formality to convince Joe Barbera that we were indeed worthy of his trust. However, Vince returned the evening before the concert, clearly insane. Drummer Bobby Clark remembered. Yeah. About six o'clock, the door opens, Vince Taylor walks in. My God. His shoes were absolutely filthy. He'd got long hair. And he hadn't combed it for about a week. Come in, he hadn't shaved for a couple of days. And he was carrying in his arm this roll of uh, material. And it was like uh, a purple, satiny coloured material. And it was all sit sitting around. And he just walks in, and we knew something was wrong. He just looked at us, he said, you think I'm Vince Taylor, don't you? Well, I'm not. He says, my name is Matthews. I'm the son of Jesus Christ. And he had a bottle of wine in his hand a bottle of Matthews wine. He had a bottle of pills in his pocket. And he's died down a bit, so I said, right, but you know we've got a gig tonight, don't you? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, that's why I'm back, that's why I'm back, he said, that's why I'm back. But uh, just a minute, we're sorry to ask you this, Vince, but you went to get us some money, right? The hotel, but we haven't eaten for three days, like we're starving. Like, please, you know, have you got any money? You've got the money? 
That's all you guys are interested in, isn't it? Money. Money. I need money. Money. Yes, I've got some money. Sir. Yes, I've got some money. Where is it? I'm Jesus Christ. Do you know what I think about money? I'll show you what I think about money. I need a little money. I mean, what are you doing, shall I? The money. It's important. It's not important. It's God that's important, not money. Outside the door, it said locomotive. It said um, Vince Taylor and Bobby Clark Noise. And as we walked through the door, Vince took a, a, a felt pen and crossed out Vince Taylor and put Matthews. Anyway, walks in, just with black leather, a bit of makeup up, lovely. And he always had a big jug of water, and it was water. So we started off. Da, 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 come on, everybody. Dum, 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 dum. Now you just keep on going till he, he's ready to come in. So he comes out on stage and gets this glass of water. See his hands. Then he walks off the stage and he walks into the audience. And it's not a seated audience, so they're, they're sitting, on the, uh, sitting on, the, on the floor. And he walks around to every single person. Water in his hand. God bless you, my son. God bless you, my son. God bless you. 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 Bless you, my son. Bless you. Stash de Roller said. Vince attempted to preach at the beginning of every number, but we started to play and he was forced to sing. The first two numbers were a huge success. But as we started the third, Jezebel, he went berserk. He started to scream like a banshee, and he smashed all the equipment. The crowd went wild, lapping it all up. But Vince left the stage and we were forced to follow. The organizers were absolutely furious to say the least. And the crowd began to riot when it became apparent that the show would not resume. Joe Barbera was appalled. Incredibly, Vince managed to persuade him to let him open a branch of the new record company in London, where I met him a couple of weeks later. It was a devastated luxury flat. And Vince was surrounded by a coterie of admirers, including David Bowie, who was still known as David Jones at the time. This was pretty much the end of Taylor's career. David Bowie remembered. I met him in uh, Giaconda one day and the guy was right out of his tree. I mean, he was playing with Arthur Deck. I mean, this guy was bonkers. Absolutely the genuine article. I can't remember if he said he was an alien or the son of God, but he might have been a bit of both. And then he, and that one day I remember on Tottenham Court Road, he dragged out this world map and we were crouching on all fours outside Tottenham Court Road tube station. And uh, he was showing me where all the aliens had their bases throughout the, under the Arctic and like in this mountain. <laughs> and this and there's people stepping over our map and I think, what the hell am I doing in the middle of Russia? with this bonkers American looking at the map of the world and he's telling me, and I thought, there's something in this, I'm going to remember this. <laughs> this is just too good. In an interview from 2010, Taylor's son spoke about that period in his father's life. He was, I think, immediately after the sort of psychedelic experience or whatever, I think it was quite damaging to him for a good ten years or so, because we saw him maybe eight, nine years afterwards and he was in a bad way, like sitting on a tube station. He'd turn up at our house sometimes and uh, he was really paranoid and thought people were out to get him and he'd clean all the cutlery if he was offered food. And uh, I think generally he was on another planet for a good ten years, but we knew of anyway. The rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust perfectly reflects the rise and fall of Vince Taylor himself. Taylor became known, not for his rise to stardom, but for his fall. And just like many artists who are cut short in their prime, his downfall turned him into a rock and roll legend, a myth. Or as Bowie put it, a rock and roll suicide. Vince Taylor died from lung cancer in August 1991, at age 52. He was buried in Switzerland, where he had lived since 1983 with his wife and his stepdaughter. Brian Licorice Locking, who played bass with the Playboys in their early days, remembered the last time he saw Vince Taylor. The last time I saw him was in Tottenham Court Road. And uh, I think he, his hair looked whitish then. He, he looked very pale, with dark glasses. And his conversation wasn't much. But he recognised me. Hello, man. He says, how are you? Come oh, man, I'm doing this, man. I'm doing that. Everything was man. He said, yeah, man, yeah. I've, uh, yeah, I've been in France and... You know, so it didn't get much beyond that. So we didn't say a lot, you know, we just 
hugged each other and had a sort of a brief chat and then he went. You know, he says, see you soon. Oh, hey, hey, hey.